Welcome, everyone, to the first episode of Vocalize, brought to you by the Vocal Council. Vocalize is all about bringing you the best no-spin insights from experts who are members of the Vocal Council. The Vocal Council is a customer think tank comprising of over 80 worldwide brands. Members in this council are key decision makers and COE leaders for automation and digital transformation from around the globe. We have Coca-Cola, Uber, Pandora, GE, Netflix, Dubai Airports, Home Depot, 7-Eleven, Netflix, Estee Lauder, Pfizer, JP Morgan, Hanover Insurance ServiceNow, Thermo Fisher, EDP in Portugal, and of course, UK National Health Services, along with many others as part of this group. Today, for our inaugural episode, I am super excited to have Darren Atkins here from the UK NHS. Darren is the Chief Technology Officer for Automation at the Royal Free London NHS Foundation Trust and has served the NHS for over one and a half decades. Darren puts the Oscars to shame with him and his team winning multiple awards and specializes in delivering true digital transformation to complex organizations. His pioneering work in intelligent automation within the healthcare sector was featured in the mainstream UK media and on BBC TV. Darren, super excited to have you here. Welcome. Yeah, hi, thanks, Shell. Thanks for inviting me. It's a real honor to be with you today. Yeah, excited to, to have you and uh, talk about the changing landscape of automation, which is our core topic here today. Uh, we, when there is never a dull moment, as you know, Darren, in this, uh, in this vastly changing and expanding landscape, um, you know, since the last many years, we've seen the lingua franca of this market continue to evolve with a milkshake of acronyms that exist out there. But that is not the only change. It's not just the acronyms itself. Can, can you describe what's causing this change? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think especially when RPA entered the marketplace, it was initially fueled by market hype. Uh, I've seen a lot of selling the dream, you know, automation can fix all of your problems. But I think in recent, it certainly seems in recent months, there's been, uh, I guess, a shift in our understanding as the market matures. And we realize that automation doesn't offer that quick win necessarily. And it is more complicated than we first envisaged. And what I'm seeing when I look at a number of the organizations that we support uh, across the world now is almost there's some flaws in the organizational, organizational strategy that exposes the weaknesses of RPA as a sole enabler. And I was sort of thinking of some, of, some of the themes and some of the things we've seen, which I think will be good to share with you, Shale. You know, RPA is seen as a great enabler, um, but what it doesn't make up for is the deficiency in digitization. So when we're working with some of our customers and we're asked to automate certain processes, a lot of those processes are very poor from the outset. So to autom automate a process that isn't working very well, is very inefficient, it's probably not the right thing that you, you, know, that you want to be doing doing equally where there's a process that has a paper trail you know paper forms human in the loop poor data quality these are all ingredients into a recipe really that's going to bring not necessarily disaster the automation will work but a lot of time having to get the robot stabilized and actually giving a good return and i think what, what, we, what we've seen now is almost you know, to deliver some meaningful automations we need more than just the core rpa tool and it's not even about necessarily investing in additional technology, you know, we need to make sure that the organization is ready for automation. And certainly I've seen, again, a lot of organizations that will go out and buy RPA technology driven because it seemed like a really exciting thing to do. Um, primarily that's done within the IT department, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but in order to be successful, we need that inclusion. We need that cultural shift within the organization to make this technology acceptable and to drive it forward, you know, almost to remove some of those barriers. So what we do in the NHS is we have a very simple philosophy called making time matter. So if we can use these robots to free up time for our hardworking staff to do more or spend more time mm -hmm. with a patient, it has to be a really good thing to do, you know. But also what we've seen is where those, I guess that foundation isn't in place, where those good practice standards and structures aren't here, it's great in the early days because you create your first couple of automations, you have great success, everybody's happy. But what you start to build rather than automations is that Frankenstein's monster, you know, building this, this thing that's going to cause you problems further down the field. And where I see now organizations that are maybe a little bit more mature than others, 
you know, maybe a year down the line, 18 months, they're really starting to struggle now because they haven't thought about this structure and this, I guess, good discipline around building automations. But, you know, we have seen this technology move really fast. We've seen you know, the marketplace dominated by you know, three or four suppliers, but there's also a lot of good technology coming in. But also there's there's limitations, you know, strategies that, that are driven by purely te technology are those that tend not to deliver. And that's what we've seen. So I'm almost suggesting to people that we're working with now is to turn this on its head. Forget about the technology. Think about why do we want to do automation? Why do we need it? What will it bring? What benefit is going to bring? And not just look at today's sort of as is type work, but where do you see it in 12 months, 18 months, five years and beyond? You know? Because once you start this journey, if it delivers well, you'll never be able to turn it off. So the decisions that you make in the early days, in the first few months, you can almost keep, you know, it's going to be very difficult to get rid of those four or five years down the line because you've bought in, you've built this massive library of automations that are running. It's very difficult to switch. And that's why I think you know, you've heard me talk before, Shah, I think about the, the technical debt of automation. And what we're building now, every single day when automations are running, we're building up a big technical debt that needs to be managed sometimes. And I think for those organizations that haven't been disciplined in their approach, it's a ticking time bomb. What I've started to see are those organizations now that are thinking, you know, do we invest in more technology? Do we renew our subscription with automation providers? Because the program of work hasn't delivered a value, it's not necessarily the technology's fault here, right? But it's the technology that's blamed, whereas really it's the approach. So I, I think the biggest driver of change right now is the wake up call about what RPA is really about. It's not a sole technology. It's one tool in a, a toolkit of many different things that we can use to automate our uh, organization. But it's also realizing that this is, some, this is something that needs to be underpinned with a strategic plan, a vision, and needs to be well controlled and managed. So that's why I think we're seeing a lot of change right now in the market. Now, that, I think that's a fair point. And I think um, what you pointed out is that automation itself in, in, the, in your journey has a uh, a broader set of technologies that need to be brought together. There is a methodology of, you know, identifying the key objectives up front on what are you doing automation for and what are the business objectives you want to achieve. And I think you talked about something that's very uh, near and dear to me, which is the technical debt as, as well. It's the Frankenstack, mm -hmm. as I call it, approach <laughs> of, uh, you know, patching together several set of technologies but we have seen multiple technologies emerge in the last two years. We've seen open source RPA. Uh, we have seen free RPA. We have seen, you know, the growth in intelligent document processing. We are seeing IBPM emerge again. We're also seeing iPaaS players getting into automation itself. Uh, this massive technology um, sprawl that is occurring in, in the automation sphere, how do, you, how do you describe that? How do you think organizations should think about these um, influx of uh, technology calls that they're getting to buy this, that, and the other solution? Yeah, I mean, it's really difficult, Shell. I almost call it the Wild West of, of automation. You know, there's so many, I guess, people coming to the market who are offering their wares. Um, but I think there has been a shift. I, I think really there's a whole suite of tools that can do more than automate the as-is. So that's where we've seen the intelligent OCR technologies come through, some mm -hmm. more around some of the cognitive tools like language translation, audio transcription, um, as well as tools that allow you to, I guess, do process discovery, you know, identify where in your organization automation can help you. On that point, I would say that if you're in your early days of automation, you don't necessarily need tools to show you where to automate because certainly where I work, you know, in the NHS, I just need to step away from my desk and, and see what's going on to realize where automation can help. And then you've got this big push around machine learning and AI, which is probably far out there compared to the core RPA. I think one of the things that um, is almost a warning, really, you know, you've heard the expression, there's no such thing as a free lunch. So when we look at open source and, and a lower cost of entry, some suppliers will provide their technology on a consumption based model. Yeah, you know, these are all great to sort of whet your appetite and get you started. But actually, unless you understand what the longer term implications are of buying into that strategy, then possibly it's going to end up being more expensive, right? So again, it goes back to that core thing. Why do we need automation and what are we going to do do with our robots when we get them? I've also seen quite a shift um, as well as a lot of talk around automation traditionally was always about 
automate, automating through the user interface, right? Uh, and it works very well. Um, it re it re requires a lot of support. If mm -hmm. there's a system change, we need to change all that. And it's almost like we're going full circle because before RPA, the whole world was around integration and APIs and, and things like this. And it's almost like we've moved away from that into RPA, but we're kind of coming back into it again, yeah. more around a hybrid type model, which I think actually is a, a is a pretty good one um, because it will help address some of that technical debt around using existing integration tools, but also having RPA as a, a layer on top to allow us to do, I guess, the full richness of functionality in any application. So I think that's kind of where the shift's going. The whole low code, no code message, I think, is scaring me slightly because I think it's mm -hmm. misleading. Just because something is low code and no code doesn't mean it's easy and doesn't mean necessarily that anybody can do it. Yes, it's more accessible. But if you want to try and do something that's a little bit more advanced, again, you're relying on a supplier to do that, which comes at great cost. You know, build your new connectors or you need the uh, resource within your organization who have those software development type skills. So um, I guess that's that that's. So the biggest changes that I've seen, moving away from the UI automation and bringing in additional tools, trying to be smarter and cleverer, going beyond automating the as is, but also more utility based cost models uh, again. But remember, as I said already, there's no such thing as a free lunch. And it's not just technology you need to invest in. It's the raft of people behind the scenes to make this stuff happen in your organization. No, absolutely. I mean, it's a, yeah, automation is as much about people as it is about technology. And it's more yeah. about people transformation, not just people. Absolutely. How do you transform? The jobs and I mean, are doing. And I mean, Shale, you, you, you work with a lot of organizations across the world and get involved with some really interesting conversations. I mean, what changes have you seen in the market? Well, I've seen this proliferation of technologies, but I am seeing more and more, particularly in this economy and with, uh, uh, with a post-COVID type of a scenario, a need to really understand automation value inside your organization. How do you yeah, communicate great. it? What is the story behind it? How do you capture it? What are the metrics that you look for? There seems to be a growing need around that and very few solutions out there, particularly with the existing vendors that are addressing this whole, what I call automation optimization uh, era. Yeah, yeah, but of course there's, there's, no, there's no desire to make your processes optimal because it means you need less robots to do what you do today right so maybe right. that's that's the conundrum that we have there i mean in terms of measuring value that's a really interesting point one observation from, from myself is all too often you know we get engaged with an organization that might have had their business case created already and the process is listed there and the potential benefits when you start to do real world analysis around those processes and and how they work in the real world sometimes those benefits aren't quite as as good as you first envisaged. So there's that gap between the business case and mm -hmm. what happens in the real world. So right. that, that's really been an interesting study for us. But also, you know, especially in healthcare, whilst we need the value in terms of trying to save some money, be more efficient, um, allow our resources to do more productive work, I think sometimes we get too, not necessarily NHS, but generally, you know, across all, all sectors, we get too hung up on that that mission to save our cash uh, i know that's important but you know these robots can do a lot more it can make make our staff feel more valued uh, manage their their mental health and well-being more effectively give them time to care these kinds of things and i think there are there's a lot of um of those softer side of of, of benefits that are never spoken about or measured anywhere mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the other really interesting thing that I've started to pick up on a lot, especially where we're working in an environment where there's lots of consultancy companies, there's supply led um, you know, developments as well as in-house ones, mm -hmm. is we very rarely, or in fact, we never, I do, but we never measure the quality of the automation based on number of exceptions. Just because an automation works doesn't mean it's necessarily a great piece of work. So, you know, we measure a lot about benefits, but we never really measure the effectiveness of that automation. And that's something that I want to study more and push forward more amongst the community. No, it's fantastic, uh, Darren. And we'd love to have you back here to talk more about what you have found in this uh, study of uh, automation effectiveness. Uh, Darren, I really appreciate you taking the time. Is there a key lesson that you want to share with, uh, with our audience here on what they should be doing to navigate this uh, uh, constant change in the market yeah absolutely and you know what it's the same conversation i seem to have every day so i'll happily uh, offer viewers and listeners this advice you know, the biggest piece of advice is forget about the technology don't worry about that close your eyes and forget it even exists 
understand what a robot can do generally at high level, you mm -hmm. know, around auto automating um, those process flows. But think about why do you need it? What do you hope to achieve? What benefit will it bring to the organization? Because at some point you're spending all this money and you're going to be asked, why have we spent this money and what has it brought back? Now, the thing is, if you do that in the outset, then it's going to mean that you're not going to buy into a tool set that's not going to deliver. And again, we see this again, time and time again. It's technology driven. They'll buy a particular vendor piece of technology. They might want to do something, let's say, with OCR or something clever. Suddenly, they need to go out and buy yet another piece of technology, which isn't included in the original business case. So in some respects, they're already failing their exec board because they're not thinking longer term. The other thing I would say as well is to really think carefully about that engaging culture for automation. Robots are our friends. Making time matter. This is so relevant. Don't believe that the automation program sits with senior leaders or your supervisors, team leaders. The best people you you involved in that program those people which we call at the coal face doing the work you know those people engaging with patients or at a reception desk whatever they may be this automation needs to engage and, and buy into the entire organization regardless of of the level and i think my final lesson which a lot of people forget and this is why you need to you should lean on others people in your own sector or in the vocal council you know build a foundation of of best practice skills standards because that will reap dividends as your journey progresses in terms of scaling, managing, uh, and that kind of thing. So they're just three, three ideas and, and things to think about. Excellent insights, Darren. Really appreciate it. I, I resonate well with all of the ones that you mentioned, particularly the automation ecosystem that you talked about towards the end um, and uh, surrounding yourself with uh, automation experts. And that's what the Vocal Council is all about. Darren, thank you so much for taking the time. This has been super exciting. My pleasure, Shao. Thanks very much. Take care. Thank you. Take care.